Hey, James, it's 7.01 now. Let's go. <laughs> All right, my microphone is on. I don't know how it um, affects the, it seemed to be an issue this afternoon. If the microphones were on here, they uh, did a lot of feedback to the ones remotely. Anyway, I'll call to order the sort of regular council meeting. It's um, been held electronically and uh, with some public uh, for Tuesday, June 2nd. And uh, uh, it's called to order. The adoption of the agenda is necessary. I don't know. I can probably see some hands if uh, somebody wants to move and somebody second the adoption. I got. I can see Todd, <laughs> uh, and I didn't see um, Councillor Gamble. All right. Those in favor? Vote. Motion carries. Aye. And adoption of the minutes from the special council minutes of um, meeting of May 19. If um, you have. Uh, Read those minutes. A mover and seconder. Councillor McKenzie and uh, Councillor Ireland. Good. Those in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. No errors or omissions, or did you have a comment? No. All right. Uh, I won't make any report other than it's awkward working with uh, Corona, <laughs> but um, and not the type you drink. But the um, announcements, Municipal Hall is opening and um, the uh, for bill payments by appointment only for mission about the uh, di district's COVID response. See our web page at lakecountry.bc.ca and uh, administration and management are all keeping up to what the provincial sort of edicts are and uh, those are what we are trying to adhere to so we're social distancing we have some public particularly people that uh, have uh, uh, either an application or an interest in an application and want to speak to it and are able to then um, we are doing social distancing in the uh, gallery and uh, seem to be working at least today. No tape, uh, uh, at least no video uh, or TV of our meetings now and um, until the uh, uh, global or Shaw comes back. And um, the other announcement is property taxes are due September 30 uh, at 6 p.m. and Property bills are being mailed and are uh, due on 6, 6 p.m. Wednesday, September 30. You can pay in person at the Municipal Hall, but we strongly encourage you to pay through your bank online or by check deposited in the drop box located at the front door. Eligible property owners need to claim the homeowner grant also by September 30, so uh, be sure to do that. And um, as an announcement, this is um, um, probably the last uh, council meeting. We may have one more or we may not before they are done for the year. Maybe they're done for the year, I'm not sure. But we always have a thank you for our youth counselors. So I'll give those up now. Yeah. All right. Excellent contributions from our youth counselors this year and a very hectic year for them. Unfortunately, we didn't get a part of uh, celebrating your graduation. Are you doing anything at all? 
Yeah, we are. We're still planning to do a sort of a sort of red carpet thing, but very specially organized so as to maintain <laughs> social distancing yeah. and not be a gathering of more than 50 people at any time or anything like that. So it would be difficult be to be very careful about yeah. it. Um, I see Mount Bushri, uh, at least Peachland students from Mount Bushri had a had a walk along the beach or something and with yeah. social distancing, but for the grad ceremony. But well, anyway, congratulations to you all. I'm sure you're all are going to pass and so and on with your further education. The um, next up uh, delegation. Uh, uh, we do have. Uh, is that online? Uh, I don't see. Yes, yes, Mr. Mayor, Dr. Matt Lurette. Bader is joining us with Heather Lorette uh, from the Cal Lake room upstairs, and hopefully our audio system will cooperate with us for this presentation. They'll be sharing their screen, and uh, Council should be able to see them on their screen now. All right, sometime. Big delay. Maybe they didn't hear you. We could uh, get Bill to sing row, row, row your boat or something. While we're waiting. <laughs> yeah. Where is Jaka? <laughs> I've been studying a new language. <laughs> you look so good when you smile, Jeremy. <laughs> Do you like my summer beard? <laughs> no, I don't like beards. I think they make people look uh, unprofessional. Each what do you do for a living? <laughs> Each year I grow it in, it just gets grayer and grayer. <laughs> you're at a you're in a meeting. Uh, yeah, Jeremy, I shaved this week <laughs> just for this meeting. Can you hear me now, Verizon? Yeah. Mr. Mayor, can you hear us? We can hear you. We can't see anything. But I can hear. Yeah, you. I know we uh, we were having we'll call it some technical difficulties. Oh, I, see. I can see. Yeah, you can see me, but our screen just went black, so it's going to be hard to do a presentation for a second. Just give us one second. Uh, <laughs> Heather's very good, but I don't know if she's uh, can remember her whole presentation by heart, so we'll have a hard time changing the screen. Just give us one second, please. She can do it off the top of her head. I've heard her do it. And, uh, I'm sure she can. You're right, Mr. Mayor. It might be. A little less organized and a lot more chaotic. <laughs> Chaos is good. Are we good? Yeah, sure. Good. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, introductions to Heather Larratt from Larratt Aquatics Consulting. Um, she's been undertaken with us for the last number of years, actually, ourselves, District of Coldstream, uh, Regional District of the North Okanagan. Um, we just went back again. Uh, anyway, so uh, I'd like to introduce Heather and she does have a presentation regarding uh, the work we've been doing the last couple of years on the boat capacity study as well as sediment study uh, that she undertook. Um, so what we're going to do because of this format, uh, please hold the questions to the end because when we share the screen we actually can't see anybody so uh, we're going to just hold the questions to the end for Heather if that works for, for everybody. Uh, and that's uh, really going to be the best way. So just introduce Heather and I'm going to start sharing our, our screen in a second. Thank you. One second, our IT professional is uh, trying to undertake the uh, technology issue that we're seeming to have in this room. If I go downstairs, is it more straightforward there? Because I'm really not Can't hear. concerned. Yeah, let's... Uh, I don't want to keep doing this. Yeah. So, oh. Mr. Mayor, we are going to come down to the uh, council chambers just and do it the same way as we did with the strategy session. And corporate officer will have to forward our presentation for us, please. Just be one second. Yeah. I'm sorry, guys. I was just sure I was here. That's mine. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 
it's my right, but I'll just. Or you can bring it. Don't worry about it. Back again, thank you. We are now in the council chambers. Just give us one second, please, to uh, bring up the presentation. The Cal Lake room is, uh, I don't even know the right words. Yes, we have the presentation we discussed. So we're good to go? Yes. Well, thank you very much. Um, Sorry for the kerfuffle, but it always seems to be that way these days. Um, Mayor and Council, thank you for inviting me here and for. Oh, you're going to control the slides? Gotcha. Okay. I'll quit, I'll quit pretending I'm in control at all. Um, and the Okanagan um, OCCP, Scott Boswell, for asking me to make this presentation. I am always excited to talk about water. And one of my favorite lakes in all the world is Kalmaka Lake. If you like Wood Lake better, that's great. <laughs> so if we can get the next slide, please. I just want to acknowledge that there's been a lot of work going on, and I'm not going to suggest that studying a problem is addressing the problem, but it's an a necessary first step. And there's been a lot of work that's been happening on these lakes. Um, for one thing, since 1999 to present, we've been doing annual monitoring, which uh, District of Lake Country has been one of the supporters of this work. And it means that for Kalamaka Lake, we have one of the strongest data sets for water quality that is existing in the province. We've done two sediment studies to try and figure out what's going on. One of the things that makes Kalamaka Lake so special is that it precipitates marl every summer. So if you're observing, you'll notice that the lake goes from a beautiful color to somewhere in the middle of the summer, it goes preposterously gorgeous. And that's the day, literally, that the marl has precipitated out of solution. Those super uh, fine marl particles settle to the bottom and they make a mud, for want of a better word, that is finer than, than clay. So it doesn't take much to kick that up, as you'll see as the presentation goes on. Anyway, we did that. There was a question as to whether there was a boat capacity for Cal and Wood Lakes that could be exceeded. What was the wave and wake impacts going on? We also did some septage studies on Cousins Bay, and there's also been a study on Bailey and Boltress Creeks, which may be um, delivering higher nutrient water to the lake. So lots of good work going on. Next slide, please. And uh, lots of ways that impacts can occur in a lake. They can be natural and they can be helped by us. And I would distinguish between the kinds of sediment disturbance that happens by wind waves that travel up and down a lake and the ones that are caused by wakes. Wind waves hit what we call experienced shorelines. They're used to that activity and there's less sediment there, whereas wakes go in every direction. So even in every lake, whether it has a man-made impact or not, the sediments are a way of storing contaminants. Contaminants come in with the water through various processes. They end up settling into the mud. So the things that you see here on the screen, hydrocarbons, that's from fuels and oils, metals, Pathogens, by that I mean things like E. coli and other bacteria and viruses uh, from the watershed and the water column travel down into the sediments. This is so much the case that 
even if every water quality parameter is met in the water column, it doesn't necessarily follow that the sediment meets uh, guidelines for aquatic life. We used to feel that if sediments had accumulated about five centimeters over contaminated sediments, so you have a contaminated sediment layer and then five centimeters on top of that, you have a new layer, the old contaminated sediments were buried and essentially gone. They weren't interacting with the water column. But of course, we've managed to come up with a way of changing that. Next slide, please. Um, this is a uh, <clears throat> glorious doodle that I created to try and show what goes on underneath these new wake surf uh, boats. Because they're ballasted, they don't go on plane like a water ski boat, they plow. And because they're plowing, they're disturbing a lot more water and their prop wash is angled down towards the substrates. That kicks up some mud, which doesn't settle straight back down to the, the lake bottom again. Because the water with mud mixed in it has a greater density, it travels like a dirty river inside the lake down to deeper places, like where your intake is. So you'll see that this becomes a problem as we travel. Next slide, please. I always think it's kind of fun to think of a sediment core this way. The further down in the core you go, the further back in time you're actually traveling. So the top few centimeters are very recent. Middle is like 50 to 30 years in Cal Lake and below about 10 centimeters, you're talking greater than 30 years ago. And just because I don't like to give the impression that things are always getting worse environmentally, when we look at deeper sediments in Kalamaka Lake, we can actually see when leaded gasoline was in use. So when you look at more recent sediments, there's less lead than there is in the past, also less arsenic. And that's because in the good old days, there was not a coddling moth anywhere in the orchards in District of Lake Country because they used arsenate of lead to deal with it. <clears throat> Anyways, we didn't know what kind of problems that would cause. So the sediments are, have accumulated metals. And one of the ways that we distinguish when we're doing these studies between sediments that were laid down a long time ago and sediments that are still being deposited now is we don't just look at cores, we look at that goofy little gizmo called a sediment trap where we put them down for a year and we look at how much mud travels into that trap over the year. They're set at different depths and different positions. And then we look at that sediment and look at the contaminants that are in it. So it's not a historic problem only. It is an ongoing problem as well. Next slide, please. Now, I absolutely love this bathymetry that we've had done. It allows us to do a lot of, of good understanding. This is the end of the lake that you don't care as much about, the north end. Um, the white circle in quote encompasses their uh, Cal Lake intake. The black squiggly line is uh, the connection between Coldstream Creek and the intake. So anything inside that black line, if there's a disturbance of the sediment there, it can make it to the intake within two hours. Next slide, please. Perhaps the side of the end of the lake that you're most interested in. I'd also like you to notice when we're looking at this map, how much of the image is orange or yellow. Those are the marl shallows and the areas where mud is readily and easily disturbed. Once again, you see the white circle encompassing your intake, just your lake country intake, and the black circle encompasses the area in which contaminants can travel in the water column or in the, in the sediment plume to the intake within two hours. Next slide, please. So when we completed the boating study, we had concluded that in the shallows, Kalamaka Lake already exceeds its safe capacity. Um, we also concluded that there were areas that were better and worse for boats to travel, both from an environmental point of view and also from a water chemistry point of view. And we recommended that commuting corridors be embraced where large power boats would not play close to shore but they would travel out to deeper water and then transit out and play in deep water. And that we needed to get some safeguards in place. One of the single biggest questions that was left from this study is how, how deep can one of these prop 
washes impact the substrates in a way that's meaningful and causes trouble. Next slide, please. So we, we felt from that point of view that we needed to look after the watershed. And in this case, that also means stormwater. We want to minimize the amount of stormwater that contacts the lake. That's not easy. Uh, no quick fixes there. Um, and that we also wanted to minimize marina contaminants in every marina I have ever sampled. The substrates underneath the marina are contaminated with hydrocarbons and various other goodies. We also felt that it was important to make respectful boating easy. By that, I mean that we don't want one rule for Kalamaka Lake, one rule for Wood Lake and another for Skaha and a different one for Okanagan and different again for Asuyas. It would be nice if we all were able to agree. At that time, we thought we needed to encourage boaters to stay more than 60 meters away from shore and in four to six meters of water. We also proposed that we use an underwater um, drone, basically an ROV, to actually assess what goes on under one of these boats. And that work was actually done. Next slide, please. You folks undertook uh, creating some education for the public and uh, or cooperated with it. And I feel that this was excellent and a great first step. There is no way that we ever want to sidestep the value of public education and getting the 80 to 90 percent of people that want to do things well on board with us. No pun intended. Next slide, please. So this is where the fun starts. This is where we started to get into um, large power boats. And interestingly enough, one of the funders from this study was actually a private resort. Next slide, please. So what we did got to do was we got to, with help of some neighbors of mine, we got to trial what happens under these boats in Okanagan Lake in Cal um, Casaloma Bay, which has soft, muddy substrate. So on the top image, you see a power a water ski boat just taking off. And you see on the lower image, the plume of sediment from him taking off. Because remember, a water ski boat initially is not on plane. It's plowing like a, 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 a wake surf boat does, a wake ski boat, whatever. Um, and interestingly enough, the operator failed to notice that he'd done it created any uh, sediment disturbance. Next slide, please. Here you have the exact same scenario starting the exact same start position with a wakeboard boat. And you can see immediately there's a plume. Again, the operator did not recognize that. And the same uh, plume three minutes later. Obviously, if it's um, in shallow a shallow lake, for example, you'd be worried about just nutrients coming up from that mud, but that's not our primary concern here. Next slide, please. So we then, after we were experienced with uh, trying it in uh, that bay where we knew that we got an impact on the bottom measurable at six meters depth. Beyond that, we couldn't detect anything. We ran a trial in your end of Kalamaka Lake. If you see that orange line in the top image, that's where we put our, our trial. We put it as far away from your intake as possible, but we're still um, guilty. And you can see the line of instruments on the on the bottom image there. Next slide, please. So this is an aerial drone image of the first pass of a very small wake surf boat in Kalamak Lake. And you can see the impact of the of the jet going down to the sediment in the center and also the wake itself pushing out and creating turbulence as well. Next slide, please. This is just some images of what uh, stills of what it looked like when we used the underwater drone to look at sediment disturbance at two meters depth. Well, not really a surprise that there was quite an impact there. Next slide, please. So what did we conclude from this? We concluded that we need to be more than in five meters of depth in Okanagan Lake, but in Kalamaka Lake, we need to be further. Next slide, please. And it does happen. Here you see the takeoff plume of the boat we were operating, but the arrows point to scars from other boats that have taken off in the past. Next slide, please. So just lovely uh, image here. We had done at this point, we'd done seven passes. And unfortunately, um, it's great for a, from a scientific perspective, but from a drinking water perspective, it was not so good. And that is, 
after we had done this, it was about 12 hours later you had a turbidity spike at your intake. So <clears throat> we are the guilty party. So in the name of science though, what can I say? Next slide, please. So we concluded from this that power boats needed to be in more than six to seven meters of water and paddle craft, if they could stay inside that, we could actually have the benefit of keeping the two styles of boating separated and avoid collisions. We also would be protecting all the environmental assets because remember when those wakes hit shore with a lot of energy, not only do they do property damage for lakeshore owners, they're also doing a lot of environmental damage to nesting waterfowl and, and other things. So that was what we draw, drew a conclusion with and um, it's been taken further as I'll explain in a minute. Next slide, please. So I've given this presentation, give or take, to a number of uh, groups, including students, and the students recommended that we have an app that people could get on their phone that would tell them where we are recommending that they go play and for what kind of watercraft they are. Most of the large boats um, have a depth uh, sounder in them, so it's not a surprise to them what depth of water is. I was a little bit shocked to discover that a wake surf boat can set you back a half a million dollars and apparently that's a moderately priced one and I'm like, I think I could build one for scratch for that much, but probably just shows how little I know um, about these, these craft. Um, it was also suggested that we employ humor with graphics. It was suggested that we employ volunteers at boat launches that had coffee on offer to try and educate the groups of people that are keen on playing, having a good time and not causing any damage. And then you can move further back um, into, do we want to go for a, a intake protection zone? Do you want to entrench that in some sort of zoning bylaw? Or do you want to try for ecological reserve status? Just even for a lake, it's called a marine park, which I find slightly confusing, but that's all right. And uh, there's also a not-for-profit um, that will give a lake or a beach um, blue flag status if it meets all of their uh, criteria. So I'm, I'm going to ask your thoughts in just a minute on this. I'm just going to show you some of the things we've learned in 2020. Aside from how to socially distance. Next slide, please. Um, this is again back in Casaloma Bay. Um, we were practicing with our drone and I told the team, go practice how to drive that thing, follow our intake out. And they said, well, well, you could only find this old busted intake. So I said, well, if it's actually our intake, if you go beyond the break, you'll find all the broken pieces, all the screens and things, because they said, we just found this pipe on the bottom of the lake. Well, guess what? Large boats that like to barge together and drag anchor either struck this with enough force to tear the whole intake apart or one of the large uh, dock repair barges that puts their poles down. We don't know which, the person or persons that did it probably have no idea, but we had a busted intake. So it was possible, although I never noticed it, that we could have had sushi being delivered with our water because there was no fish screen, no nothing, just sit right on the bottom of the lake. So they've proposed and implemented a repair and you can see where the proposed new and improved intake actually just went in last week. Thank goodness. Uh, next slide, please. You see the circle? by that dock right where the uh, intake goes towards shore. They were busy trying to feed the new pipe into the old one to use the old one as protection for the new pipe and they got to a place where they hit a problem. Next slide please. When this dock owner put it as I believe it's illegal extension on their dock when the barge put down their poles to put in the dock extension they crunched the intake pipe. So not only was it broken on the outside, it was broken on the inside. And this is my tale, my moral of the story, is I think we need to let at least these operators know where this infrastructure is. The province doesn't know. I think we need a water going down before you dig kind of concept. Anyways, that was quite the lesson learned. I was drinking this. I'm like, that's really inspiring. Anyhow, next uh, slide, please. I'd like you to know also that the work and research that we're doing on Kalamaka Lake um, has gone far and wide. I've been uh, reached out to by a couple of groups from Alberta that have shallow lakes. So um, they're benefiting from this research as well. 
And our final thought, next slide please. Lest you think that there's nowhere to play if we start restricting votes, um, if you look at the dark blue and green in these uh, lake images here, that's where we would recommend that large power boats play. So I think there's lots of space for everybody, um, but that doesn't mean I can make everybody happy. Um, in fact, I think that's impossible. So with that, I will entertain your, your questions. Very if good. Thank you very much. I uh, had a message from... Oh, and uh, there's a video if you want to watch it. Um, Councillor Ireland with regard to wake boats. I don't know how it came up here, but uh, he's more tech savvy than I am. So, uh, Councillor Ireland, you had a question or comment uh, regarding wakes on, uh, wake boats on Cal? No, um, in, in fact, uh, I think it was Kara who got a, a note about uh, wakeboard boats on Cal Lake. And then we all kind of responded to each other because uh, they were wondering if they were on Okanagan Lake as well. And and that's, that's a fact this weekend. Uh, tons of wakeboard boats going to the launch. You know, not everybody, but a, a substantial few that are way close to shore, you know, given that the regional district and Okanagan Lake is about what 0.1 meters over full pool. So, you know, they're supposed to stay away from the shore. Um, they're supposed to stay away from the shore anyways, but uh, they're certainly not. So, uh, you know, not all of them by any means, but there's enough to make a difference. So uh, that's Good. just the only comment I would make on that. Um, I would make a comment about uh, that water intake that have been damaged by a barge uh, or a su suspected barge. This happens all the time to our water lines. And uh, um, just down the road from uh, path, going to the south from the uh, from the uh, safe boat harbor, there was an incident where uh, one of those companies dragged their barge. The barge shouldn't even be anchored in that bay because it's not protected in any way. Um, but they dragged anchor and they pulled out a water system that serviced seven houses and uh, destroyed it. You know, pump it, it's underwater pump, the whole nine yards, destroyed everything. And uh, and then refused to help pay for it. The owners had to go after the insurance company. You know, I mean, they're out of water on Friday night and there's nobody responding to them to help fix their water situation. So, um, you know, this company got sold, it's gone broke, it's it's apparently been repurchased and rebranded, but I don't know how we we look at uh, controlling this, but I mean, and, and not all these companies are bad. There's a, quite a few companies that they're very responsible and don't do the wrong thing, but there are enough out there that, that aren't responsible. They build illegal docks. They, they tell the owners, oh, they'll get them the permission. Don't worry about it. Um, they can do whatever they want. And uh, that's certainly not helping our situation. You know, I mean, it's, it's not just large water, water intakes, but it's small water intake. Thank you, Councillor Arden. I have Councillor. Uh, in response, we need underwater mapping or infrastructure mapping, obviously, and that doesn't occur on our lake shores yet, but uh, hopefully we'll get to it. Councillor Gamble, question, comment? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, a couple. First of all, I want to thank Heather for the uh, very interesting uh, and well presented report, which we could hear very well, by the way. Um, and I just want to make mention of a couple of things. Um, the wake boats have been a problem, uh, certainly in Woods Lake over the years, um, especially in the shallower areas. Uh, and uh, uh, that can affect public and private systems. It's not just the public systems. There are many private systems that have been affected by that. Um, so it's really good to see some actual um, positive uh, recommendations with the, the blue sort of, which is uh, the area that is kind of safe and deeper. I guess the concern that I would have is, will that work for wakeboard boats? Um, because I think they prefer the shallower water. So this might continue to be an issue. Um, and while I'm talking, I just want to mention that uh, there have been concerns raised for a number of years about the need to dredge the canal 
um, so that boats can get through that. I mean, people were just about ready to go and dig it themselves last year. So, um, you know, I know that this is a, a big issue and I would like to hear Heather's comments on what is a reasonable thing to do there. Um, because I'm wondering, is it possible for people to go from one lake to another to turn their motors off and use, uh, you know, use um, uh, oars, uh, just manual, you know, uh, poles to get through that canal? Are there ways it could be done um, and not uh, cause as much impact? And then my final question, which is an actual question, is how far is the Vernon intake offshore as compared to our district um, intake? How many how many meters difference between the two? Because it seems to me, I thought ours was in quite shallow water. Thanks, Heather. I think I'm going to answer these if it's all right in backwards order. Your intake sure. is tied at 20 <laughs> meters. Um, theirs is a little bit deeper now because they were only 60 centimeters above the substrate, like that much clearance between where the intake was and where the mud is. So they've raised theirs and gone slightly deeper. You're about the same distance offshore. If, if anything, yours is longer, so further offshore than theirs is because you have to get past the shallows to get there. But you are in 20 meters, which back in the day when that was put in was the recommended, and two meters off the bottom. What's kind of funny is your intake has two sucker fish that like to keep it clean and their <laughs> intake has none. So the last time I gave this presentation, they wanted one of your sucker fish and I don't know if you guys have ponied up. <laughs> <laughs> the, next, the next question was judging the canal. This is not straightforward and it's not simple. And the larger the boat is, the deeper the draft it needs to get to get through uh, that canal. It's not going to be straightforward to do it. There are all kinds of issues. Um, the easiest one would be there will be habitat issues. The next is there'll be wall, uh, the one wall. You're going to have to watch that. But the biggest issue is this is a navigable waterway, so you need federal approval, I believe. And also, if you think about it, the water that travels back and forth between the lakes, generally the water travels from wood to cow. But that depends on the elevation of both lakes. It can go either way. And we've actually proposed trying to figure that out, but that's almost a university research project, you know. <laughs> but anyways, if we if we deepen that by say a meter, if you can imagine you're taking from a, this is imaginary, but a pipe size this big between the two lakes and making a pipe size this big. So it's not, it's not a simple matter. We do know, for instance, that when Wood Lake has a cyanobacteria bloom, which produces cyanotoxins, it can travel and depending on which way the lakes are flowing, it can hit your intake. We've been watching that over the years. So like I said, it's not a straightforward thing. It's not going to be simple or quick. And we need to think about all the ramifications of doing that. I sympathize with people. I am rather expecting with all the turbulence that's been happening of boat traffic back and forth, um, and I do know for a fact that some boats travel through there quickly and they are moving sediment that there is ha and has been some infilling. I wouldn't dispute that, but I, I would caution that this is not going to be a quick or straightforward fix and we have to be very careful that we don't fix one problem and create another. Your final, Good answers. Oh, <laughs> carry on. Your final question or your first question actually that I'm going to answer at last is um, people need to like to travel shallow with these deep, deep boats. I thought it was very interesting when I contacted the two companies um, that operate wake surf boats on Kalamaka Lake and at, ex explained what I wanted to do and ex uh, explained it, it was a study. They were both completely on board with it. I was thought they would try to run me out of town, but <laughs> that wasn't the case because they've been told by the manufacturer get your patrons to go deep or you're going to start having trouble with lakes. Mm -hmm. The shallow lakes get hit hard fast. And they've also encouraged people that if they are in less than seven meters of water, they're going to have an awful wave. The wave isn't a nice, clean, big, happy wake surf wave. I don't know what that means, <laughs> but it means something to them. What the translation to me is, if your wave has a different shape, it means the bottom of that wave is hitting the bottom of the lake. Mm -hmm. There's no two ways around that. So maybe that's one way to encourage these folks. I know they want to be seen. 
But if they're going <laughs> to yeah. have a prettier wave, maybe they'll go out deeper. <laughs> it's a thought. Yeah, that's a good thought. Um, Councillor Scarrow. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, a, a couple of things that have floated up here. You, you mentioned that Cal Lake is always over capacity, but you never really mentioned what the capacity is. And I know that that's kind of a floating number, but I would like to know at least a ballpark or a range of what that capacity may be. Uh, secondly, um, you talked about the different depths that wake boats create damage on Okanagan Lake as compared to Cal Lake, as compared to Woods Lake. So I understand that the lake bottom obviously plays a role in that. And uh, of course, your studies on Cal Lake. So I'm, I'm wondering, do we know anything at all about Woods Lake, its bottom and its capacity? Or is your study exclusive to Cal and you kind of never looked up that way? Lastly, or one of the last things is um, the canal between Okanagan and or between Wood and Cal Lake. Could it be serviced with a motors off pulley type of uh, T-bar type thing that you'd use on a ski mountain where you'd actually pull uh, boats that are shut off through that canal? And would that still cause some of the damage that we're having or would that eliminate an awful lot of it? And um, the last option is the fairly obvious one is, is there any possibility of banning uh, wake boats on one or more of those lakes? Thank you, I'll wait your answers. Hmm. Thank you, I think hmm. I'll answer yours in the, hopefully the order that you asked them. Um, about capacity, I was actually quoting the first study that we did in 2016. So it's actually a boat capacity study with all the mathematics and equations and all those good things to figure out how many boats per square, well, I'm going to say square meter, but that's obviously dumb, um, you can have on the lake. And it proved basically what the residents were telling me at the south end of the lake on a weekend, it's over capacity. It's over the safe boating capacity. Mm -hmm. And they, they tend not to put their boats out on long weekends. And the whole of this study began because your staff recognized that are on the water system that they had this strange occurrence of turbidity issues on the intake on sunny long weekends. <laughs> yeah. So and I said, oh, I can't be the boats. That's that was where I started, but I've, mm -hmm. I've gotten smarter since. So that work is already done, sir. Um, yes, it's true. We looked at Kalamaka and we looked at Okanagan Lake. In Okanagan Lake, the impact was visible at six meters. In Cal Lake, it was actually deeper than eight. Eight is the deepest that we thought to look. Silly us. So the recommendation is, and actually it has been passed by Cold Stream Council, they're recommending that all of the Okanagan go to eight meters as sort of that boundary between an appropriate place for power boats to play and an appropriate place for paddlecraft that recognizes all the other issues as well, drinking water, environmental risk, and so on. Before you go on, could I ask, is the bottom of Woods Lake completely different than the bottom of Cal's Lake? Are they completely different environments? They're not completely different because as you probably have noticed over the years, Wood Lake will also marl the same as Cal Lake does. So it's got some of that marl sediment but it also goes profoundly anaerobic on the bottom. So it's black mm -hmm. and stinky as well, which Cal Lake is not. And that's why Wood Lake has a lot of internal nutrient loading. And that's why it's such a uh, good kokanee fishery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just doesn't happen to make a great drinking water source. Um, and you had the idea about the canal, motors off, absolutely would eliminate a lot of the problems would eliminate a lot of the angst that I see uh, between the residents that live nearby in the Twin Lakes, Twin Lakes. campground and, and boaters. Maybe not all of it, because there seems to be sign language and music and issues as well, but whatever. <laughs> um, and I love the idea of a pulley dragging them along. I think we could have like, I think that's marvelous. I think that's very creative. I've never thought of it, um, but I think that's a great idea. Well, hardly any people call me marvelous, but I appreciate that. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Heather, for the presentation. Um, speaking back to the uh, 
comment that Blair opened with that uh, it was very um, timely, as I'd heard from a resident in Oyama on the east west east side, um, who was concerned about the wake boats, and it was it was specifically from the damage that they were causing to the beach and the loss of the um, the sediment on the beach as well, which was being taken up by the wake boats. So, um, oh, my computer's just gone. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. OK, I just my screen's gone black. I'm going to keep talking. Um, so um, my question was um, particularly around intake zones. Um, the uh, the same issue was raised over on Okanagan Lake in relation to the drink, um, the intakes in uh, Coral Beach and also off Gable Beach, um, particularly the Gable Beach one, which is very uh, shallow and the Coral Beach one from the amount of boating activity that takes place there. Um, a lot of power boats come in, drop anchor, and there was a lot of concern from the residents last year that uh, the intake was going to be damaged. So I think I would be very much in favour of, I think you called them intake protection zones. Um, and uh, we are also reviewing our zoning bylaw and your comment about the um, the boat capacity, obviously, the, the ability to store boats and, and access the water is, it has a significant impact on boat capacity. And I know when we were looking at the zoning bylaw, there was some discussion about changing the shape of the docks. Um, and I know, I believe the original uh, framework for that dock bylaw, part of the bylaw, was to limit the amount of watercraft that could be placed on the lake. Um, so that you didn't end up with one dock sporting, you know, maybe two or three boats. So I think that's something for us to think about when we're reviewing that zoning bylaw. Um, and I, I do like the idea of the app. Um, I was wondering what would you suggest in terms of uh, buoying the, the uh, eight metre zone? Is there best practice in terms of the type of voice to use, the visibility, the impact that it has on the environment and the aesthetics of the lake? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I would not suggest that we put out boys. Um, I think it would look awful and you actually need uh, federal per per, um, permission to do it, uh, which takes like, well, it, before, before COVID, it took like mm -hmm. six, to 10 years, so who knows what it takes now. Um, but our suggestion, the suggestion from the students was to actually map where they can play and map where the intake protection zone is, but not necessarily show the exact position of the intake for fear that there would be the odd person that would take that as a challenge to try and score a bullseye or I don't know <laughs> what. But anyways, um, just to show the intake protection zone, because obviously, that's the area we really need people to pay attention. We've got two hours before it's going to be in the intake. It doesn't give you much time to respond if there's an issue. Um, yeah, I think that would be the best idea. Um, so you would have uh, mapping available at the boat launch. You would do perhaps this app, but you would not put out boys. I think for one thing, people would tie off to them. And the strangest thing happened at the other end of the lake. They put out a boy to show the end of their intake, thinking nobody's going to do anything. <laughs> Actually, nobody did anything because it had a big sign on it, and they, they, the community around publicly shamed anybody that tied up to it. But the seagulls that like to feed at the dump did not get that message. <laughs> and they found it was just a marvelous pace, congregate around the yellow boy. So you <laughs> could actually look in the water and see all the yeah. dropping. <laughs> dropping through the water column. It really wasn't what we were after, but I, I couldn't have foreseen that one. That was pretty funny. Oh, uh, the one thing I was going to ask Heather with the app um, and obviously with crowdsourcing GI information and things like that, would it be possible to add the functionality for property owners if they do have a private intake on the lake to actually include that on the mapping? Are uh, you making it their responsibility to identify where it was, but allowing that to be to speak to Blair's point about it's not just public water intake, it's private water intakes that are affected as well. That's a great idea. If they're mm -hmm. willing and mm -hmm. sure, it would be have a license. <clears throat> yeah, um, but it would be great. Um, and I think that would also just keep informing people, especially if they're from out of 
the region. This isn't just a lake to play on. This is drinking water, and some people just don't make that connection very well. Right. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Oh, sorry. Have you finished, Councillor Reed? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, thanks very much. Yeah, uh, Councillor Kozu. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Heather, for your uh, report. Uh, when I read it, I got so excited I couldn't sleep that night. I stayed up the whole <laughs> night. Uh, if we're talking nautical terms, I can actually say that this is for sure in my wheelhouse. I grew up on Wood Lake uh, on a little farm, and I know that was only five years ago, Blair, but <laughs> I watched that lake transform from a quiet little lake to what it is now, or I don't even go out on it because I don't enjoy it. Uh, it was neat when I was reading your report, all of those uh, pictures and stuff like that. Uh, Greg and uh, Kyle are both water quality grads and uh, one of the classes that I got to take in uh, university was limnology for me and Walker. So I don't know if uh, you've ever done any work with him or whether he's retired now or not. But uh, as far as the sediment uh, kick up, the other one of the other things I am is uh, a scuba diver. And yeah, once you're in the water and stuff like that and, and other divers kick the, kick the bottom, I know exactly what you're talking about. And that footage you showed there, that was just some awesome, awesome photos of what it actually happens, what it's actually like. Uh, Todd and I have been trying to work, and the other counselors, but we've been trying to work on getting that dredged out. So just as if we keep pushing and pushing, eventually we'll do it one day. And uh, if Coldstream is going to be putting in some sort of eight meter uh, um, uh, whatever you want to call it, I'm not sure with the, the actual bylaw or whatever. Should we support them in that too then? If they're going to be doing that endeavor that way, it would be all of Wood Lake and all of Cow Lake would be the same if we go streamline with what Coldstream is trying to do. And uh, I've seen that uh, you're maybe looking for some water ambassador volunteers, so uh, I nominate Todd. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you, Councillor McKenzie, I have you next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks, Heather, for that presentation. Um, so I spend uh, quite a bit of time on those lakes, seeing I live right between both of them, and I get to watch that um, cat canal at, on a daily, walking my dog. So I get to see a lot about what that lake does, and um, I watch a lot of boats go through that channel, and they're stirring up a whole lot of mud, and that's heading usually 90% of the time into Cal Lake. Mm -hmm. The other 10%, it goes into Woods Lake, which confuses some people. <laughs> but um, so I would, uh, you know, want to look at that um, that canal a little closer to see what we can do, because no matter what, we're not, um, we're always going to be stirring up that mud there. And that is hitting into our water supply for sure, as you have, have pointed out. So that whole shallow area all the way out to where we have our intake, it would be kind of nice if we could have restricted speed zone in there. I don't know how we accomplish that if we're not going to be putting buoys out because that's usually the only thing that's going to, you know, have some kind of marker to show people. I know in, in the fishing world, they put a big triangle on the side of the lake on one side and another one on the other side, and it's everything across that line is included. Whether that would work, there we get a lot of people that don't know the lake. <laughs> you have to educate them somehow. The signs, so I do believe we need to restrict the speed. Um, as far as Bill's idea of pulling the boats through, the only problem with that is if you go there on a busy day, there will be six boats backed up on one side and eight boats on the other side, <laughs> and you're you're only going to complicate that issue. So unless you can do multiple boats and have some kind of person monitoring that, <laughs> you're going to probably end up with a pirate battle on the water. Maybe it'd be like a ski lift, you know, where you have yes. different chairs going in the same direction. <laughs> so there, there is... You know, it's definitely a big issue and I see what the water is a little higher right now and this is where the problem came in when we flooded. The um, waves actually erode the, the um, sand and the dirt off the bank and pull it into the middle. Sure. And so underneath that bridge, if you walk there on shallow water, you'll see that it's eroded quite badly actually and at some point yeah. somebody's going to have to go in there and take a look engineering wise and see if that's still uh, good or if it's getting compromised. So that's some of the issues I see with that area. 
Um, so my my question would be um, with that canal, what we do, right? And I realize that it's a, it's a bigger question than just dredging. So I would be interested in where's the next steps. In my conversations with the federal boys, the federal guys said that it's not their jurisdiction to do that because it's you're actually taking dirt out of the bottom. Um, so they are calling it a provincial thing. So this is one thing I found in in talking and asking questions is this is something that everybody points the finger at somebody else and nobody nobody seems to have the full authority to deal with it. So it is definitely an interesting one. So I look forward to us um, talking more about this one. For, for sure. I appreciate that. Um, so oh, sorry. Oh, as far as um, maybe I'll just finish the whole and just see if it, you might be able to answer multiple. <laughs> The um, as far as um, the big boats on the lake go, you, you know, I, I'm a fisherman as well, so I kind of like just putting around in the lake. And if you're close to shore where most fishermen go on Woods Lake, because that's very popular, these big boats somehow think that it's um, some, you know, if they're showing off or what they're doing and they want to go between the fishing boat who's in shallow water and the shore. <laughs> so it's it's quite often that you will have those boats go right by you and then they turn around and go right by you on the inside. So not only you get the waves one side, you get them both sides because you get the reflection waves so off delivered. the shore. So I don't think it's anything other than them because they can't possibly think that that's any calmer water than the middle of the lake. And those big boats, it doesn't matter. They make their own wave and they can go in rougher water or calm water. So I think it's more just uh, educating them and I don't know how you do that properly or effectively. <laughs> um, and then uh, I think that's, uh, I, I love the idea of the BC1 for lake infrastructure. But again, my only question on that one would be if you mark it, they will come. And I do think that somebody will take it as a challenge to try and hit the bullseye. So. <laughs> um, the general area would be nice, but I don't think marking it precisely is a smart idea to do. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, in answer to your comments and question, um, I would also add to your fun with the, uh, there's two, no, three locations on Wood and Cal that we sampled in 2018 that were very, very contaminated. The two marinas and the canal, mm -hmm. which is not a surprise to anyone. But so that's that substrate is contaminated as well. And it's tragic in a way that the boats are making life difficult for themselves and others in actually accelerating the infilling of, of the channel. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's not going to be straightforward. And we're going to have to be careful that we're not promoting something that we can't, we can't live with the end product of, right? So that's going to be challenging and I don't, I, that's where I, I try to play dumb and it's not <laughs> it's it's not science this is politics now so yeah. um, uh, I would suggest that a boy line would be a last resort I would also suggest that speed limits don't work so those boats go slow unless mm -hmm. it's a really 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 slow they're they're putzing along at uh, 12 k's per hour it's, it's a very slow boat so speed per se doesn't really do it um, and of course, as you've probably observed, the wakes from those uh, wake surf boats are tighter. The waves are tighter together and they're taller. And so they strike whatever they're going to strike with more energy. Hmm. So, you know, it's just, uh, and they're not getting smaller. I've seen a couple out on Okanagan Lake this year. I'm like, okay, that's how you spend half a million dollars on a boat, whatever. <laughs> um, I agree that the next steps won't be straightforward. And I had not heard that these big boats were deliberately bullying. I thought they just wanted to be seen, but that's not that's not encouraging at all. And you know, maybe that's when any sport is new, you get the individuals attracted to it that like to bully. I don't know. <laughs> but one of the things that we did do to try and educate, one of the reasons that we took the approach that we did, so we didn't do a whole bunch of science and pages of equations in the reports. We thought it would be better to actually show people what we see. Mm -hmm. So we did actually create a video, which I don't know if you want to afford the time or you feel you're out of time, but
but we do have a video that um, can't, you can watch where you actually see what we see underwater. And um, hopefully it helps explain to people why we can't just carry on the way we've been doing, not with, with the way boats are changing. Is the video here? It, it is. All right, Wilson, we have time. Everybody's had a good. Uh, I, I think. Uh, Mr. Thank Mayor, you very much. By the um, way, Great probably for for ease of it, I'll send it around to Mayor and Council just because it is uh, 150 some megs. Like, oh, uh, okay. So it's it's a fairly what five minutes at least, like yeah, five twenty five. Um, five twenty four, and the commentary is off. So what I'll do is figure out from my Google Drive because it's big how to share yeah. that around to Mayor and Council mm -hmm. for a review, um, and try to attach the link to the uh, the minutes um, for the public uh, consumption of that. That's a good plan. Yeah, thank, okay. you. thank you very much. And um, um, you ready for a second round, or uh, you'd, I have three other councillors. Oh, three councillors that. I'm at your pleasure. Good time, um, Councillor Ireland. Again, or are you done? Oh, uh, okay. you know I'm not done because you kind of surprised me in the first one there. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, it's been an excellent presentation, and. Um, one of the, the things that just occurred to me uh, just now is, is sort of my last little bit, but I'll, I'll launch it first is in this video. Um, is this video getting any play on in any media? I mean, could we put this video on Castanet and, and say this is what people are doing? I mean, talking about educating people, it's not going to work with the people that uh, drive the wake boat boats all around Todd's fishing boat <laughs> or uh, the people that try to kill me in my sailboats. <laughs> uh, on a regular basis so but uh you know it's, it's certainly a way of getting that message out to lots and lots of people right so, so uh Indeed. i had i don't know if you thought about that heather or not um the uh w another question i had for you that internal nutrient loading that's in woods lake is that attributable to any specific thing farming and sewage is it just a function of that particular lake? Sure. Um, where's that coming from? Um, okay, um, I'll answer them in reverse. The internal nutrient loading in Wood Lake has been happening for hundreds of years. I do not suppose that our development of land in its watershed has helped matters any, but I would say that by and large it's natural and that's partly why it's such a renowned kokanee fishery. Mm -hmm. If you want a lake to pump out a lot of fish, it's got to have a lot of nutrients. So it's kind of at odds with the kinds of lakes where we <laughs> want to pull drinking water. Mm -hmm. And that's that's why. So a lot of that is natural. I'm not sure that all of it is, but if we look at the mud, like if you go down hundreds of years worth of mud in Wood Lake, you still have very high nutrient mud. Mm -hmm. um, to answer the question about the video on Castanet, I would actually be interested in your opinion and I would defer to the council here on what your wishes might be. We have a minimum of subtitles in it because we felt we would always be voicing it over and we didn't put more information on it because we thought we could just adapt what we say to what the audience is, right? Um, but I'm, if you feel that there's value in uh, uh, uploading it to Castanet or your own website or wherever and you wanted more subtitles or less, Please let us know. Uh, we feel very strongly about this as a company and we'll just do it. Sure. And uh, you're welcome to use it. It has gone through the BC Lake Stewardship Society, which is how Alberta got a hold of it. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty exciting, really, to me that just giving people a chance to see what's actually going on instead of burying them in a bunch of boring mm -hmm. science actually has been the right approach in terms of educating the folks that want to do right mm -hmm. by a lake. Good. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, I 100% I agree. And, and I think that's a really exciting way to get the message out there. So I'd be super interested, in, you know, I mean, I'd like to see it, but super interested in seeing us getting this on casting and in any other kind of media that could be out there because we, we need to get to a broad lot of people. Mm. I mean, one of the problems that boating suffers from is that you know, there's guys like Todd who have boated, or, or myself, have boated all our lives. But the majority of people driving these big boats around, 
you know, these half a million dollar boats, they have very little boating experience. Or if they go and rent one from someplace, they don't even have to have a boater's license. Mm -hmm. So they have, and even if you do have a boating license, there's no practical exam. So mm -hmm. it, it's marginal at best, the training that it puts into you. So to, to really to get that message out there, I would like to see us have this at all of our boat launches and, and at the marinas, you know, in our interest, Twain Lake Marina, um, you know, just to do as much as we can. Because I, I don't think these people realize, you know, there's places in California that have forbidden boating. That's you me. can no longer power boat on those lakes because they're water sources. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, it, it seems like it, it could never happen here. Well, uh, it, you know, it might not in our lifetime, but it could happen. Yeah. It could definitely happen. So Thank you. Uh, I'd like to see us target, you know, the marinas, all our boat launches. I mean, I know that the boat launch near me, which is highly used, never uh, doesn't have any kind of signage involving that. So I'd like to see it down there for sure. So they, thanks again, Heather. This has been a tremendous, uh, tremendous presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Reed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd speaking to Blair's point, I think what what struck me also in Heather in your presentation is that when you were talking about the boats who made the wake, you mentioned a number of times that the operator was unaware of it. So it was just something that they hadn't considered. So therefore, education would be the key. And maybe there's an opportunity to engage with the Okanagan Rail Trail and the ambassador program that they have there to help educate um, the wider public. Um, my question to you would be, Obviously, you can hear there's a lot of interest and energy and passion in council about what, what you've said and, and taking action. If you could get your wish list and have three things that this council would do um, in the next 12 months, what would they be? Oh, what a wonderful <laughs> question. <laughs> um, you're right. Um, the operators were unaware. Like when I, I was on one of the boats in, in Cal Lake. And I asked the drone operator when we got back to the office, did you get anything? Because I didn't think there would be. And he goes, oh yeah. We put it on the screen. I'm like, what? So even I was surprised. So definitely there's room for education. I would really love for, I'm not telling you what to do, okay? <laughs> I was asked for a wish list. It's I'm just, asking you what you <laughs> I'd love for you to, um, endorse the concept of, of separating whether and I think eight meters is a is a wise place um, to separate the different boating activities. Um, I realize that won't be necessarily all that straightforward once you get into it. Mm -hmm. I would also like to suggest the app. I think that's a good first start for educating people. Most young people to my utter amazement have their phones on boats. In fact you can't separate them from their phones. So the fact <laughs> that they don't like water very much, doesn't seem to matter so much. And I think um, signage, good old fashioned signage with friendly people that are already talking about invasive mussels. Um, and I think we need to keep it from being doom and gloom. I feel like our entire society is oversaturated with emergencies. Even before COVID, I would have said that, never mind mm -hmm. now. So I feel like it needs to be, um, the messaging needs to be fun. So I think we start there and then we start looking at rules after that. Because I do believe that it's possible to have boating and safe drinking water coexist, but it does take mm -hmm. everybody cooperating. All right, thank you. Um, you. Councillor Scarrow. Hi, you guys, it's been a long discussion, so I'll be really, really quick. I'd just like to go back to um, the canal and uh, directly talking to my fellow councillors. We have to, um, with the kind of stuff that's going through that canal, as Todd says, it's degrading it every day, <clears throat> degrading it even further. Um, Councillor Gamble mentioned that there was some people, local people that were going to get out and deal with it themselves, which would probably be the wrong thing to do. At some point, me not being a boater and Todd and Blair being boaters, is it a necessity to have that canal open or is it a convenience? And is the convenience worth the, worth the cost to our water, that canal and the environment? 
or is it a mitigated type of thing where in the summer when the water goes down, perhaps we should consider closing that to boat traffic? And then going back to the, the tow bar type of idea, um, less boats going through is better for the environment and for our water. So if it was done in a controlled one this way, one that way manner, and if it took some time, then those six boats that are waiting out there to cross would go do something different. <laughs> and, and, and maybe that's maybe that's not a bad thing. So this is just mostly for council just to say, maybe we ought to think about that. I, I don't know. I wouldn't miss it. You too, Mike. But but that's my thought. Thanks for your time. Thank you. you know, I'll get you. Uh, I have Jeremy and then we'll get the uh, youth counselors to give us some perspective. No, I just wanted to rebring up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to rebring up the uh, eight meter buffer thing that Coldstream is is moving forward with it and get some more information on that and see if we can streamline with them and make it a concentrated effort would hold more weight. Maybe even as well the regional district of North Okanagan because they're the west side of the lake in a bunch of areas I know. And as well, you said about speed, but uh, is it as well that uh, you have no wake zone? So it doesn't matter what speed they're going, they can't make it, they're not allowed to make a wake type thing. Yeah. And yeah, I didn't allude to that too, but uh, I'm, I got a speedboat as well too. And uh, it's a big uh, cabin cruiser. And for me to get through that channel, I, pretty much everybody on the boat has to get on the nose of the boat. So it dips down so the leg can come up enough so I can get through. And that's why I don't even really go out there anymore because it's, it's not conceivable for me, so I, that's why I'm pushing for this canal to get fixed too. And I don't think the idea of a uh, tow rope thing would work too well because of the infrastructure mess of that. That uh, like, how would you even? You'd have to put in footings on either side and have mechanically. I just could not see that working at all. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> councillor. Thank you, Meyer. Um, I, I would just like to say I love the app idea. I think that would be really cool. But also, um, I don't know if you guys have like an Instagram page, but I think getting like the video out on Instagram um, would be pretty helpful because I know um, a lot of like everyone has Instagram basically and they all would see it on there. And I think that would be a cool way to get out there. Good idea. Yeah. yeah. All right. Councillor Templer? Templer? You don't have anything? Good. Okay. Um, Councillor Gamble. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And I'm, I like this discussion and all, but I, I just think, uh, and I think Alberto has probably um, uh, given the best suggestion that uh, he's going to assign this discussion of the eight meters uh, to, uh, to Matt and come back with recommendations. Um, just because I, you know, I was going to suggest a notice of motion because uh, I, I do think it's important for the public have an opportunity to hear about this and have an opportunity to comment. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're on it. Sorry, uh, Your Worship, if I may. Oh, yes. Um, uh, a couple of things. Uh, we are at this point because uh, there was a previous resolution uh, of Council on uh, uh, authorizing this uh, study uh, along with uh, uh, other jurisdictions and uh, agencies as uh, Heather described. Um, obviously, this is uh, just uh, one of the steps in the process. So uh, we are going to continue to uh, do the work. We've got the input and feedback from Council with respect to policy, with respect to a number of other issues. And obviously, we're going to work with Heather on all those. Uh, and uh, we're going to come back to Council with uh, some uh, options to consider and recommendations. Uh, formally, we don't need a resolution of council because the resolution of council was given already uh, uh, when uh, we started this process. Great, thank you. And thank you very much for a great presentation and uh, just keep on studying. <laughs> Science is good. <laughs> Uh, just Mr. Mayor, thank you. Just yes, thank you to Heather. Um, for counselors that brought up their wish list, et cetera, I'd just <laughs> like to happily say that we're ahead of you actually on this, and your wish list has already been being looked at in terms of yeah. if council remembers the discussion about a paddle trail that we are working on, mm -hmm. the opportunity with regional district and district of Coldstream. Um, as uh, Alberto said, where this came from is the council resolution in 2016, I believe it was starting that we do have an official uh, working group with. Okanagan uh, Conservation 
collaborative program, uh, District of Coldstream as well as Regional District North Okanagan. And they were successful uh, Okanagan Collaborative Conservation Program with a OBWB grant this year. Um, so the pamphlets that Heather showed came from that program. Uh, we talk fairly regularly and um, education is the first step. Uh, so there is further information coming out as well as we're looking at those strategies for whether it be the tactics through Instagram, sharing these things. So we're on that path already. I hope that um, addresses some of that. But when we talk about coordination, yeah, we're working with District of Coldstream already to make sure we're coordinated on the lake um, and the actions that we take are consistent amongst each other. So that has been a partnership and we did receive a $25,000 grant this year. Oh, the OCCP did. Mm -hmm. um, to benefit this work. So there is funding there through that group um, for better and as Heather uh, said, happy signage. Um, we are in alignment with that thought and we'll continue to work on, on those programs. So thank Great. you. Great. Um, Councillor Ireland had a question for Matt or comment. And Kara, Councillor Reed. Uh, yeah, thanks Matt for that uh, that discussion there. It's, it's good to see that we're going down that track but I'm just going to respond to the, uh, the the talk about the cable tow it's actually a hundred percent viable there's there is a cable there's there's a cable park in West Kelowna that's been discontinued for wakeboarding so it could be that sort of thing could be easily adapted to this sort of thing the infrastructure is not that big it exists in the water there are cable parks all over the world so that people can wakeboard without having a boat so it exists all over the place so uh Having worked at ski resorts and being involved with ski lifts all my life, that, that's a hundred percent viable thought. It sure would back things up and take time, but um, there's actually a used piece of infrastructure still sitting in the lake doing nothing in West Kelowna. I think there's three different cables. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would just ask for the support of Council um, in extending the, the program that Matt's talking about to cover the Okanagan Lake as well, because I think we do have an issue with intake protection. And I know this study is focused on Cal Lake, but if if staff are working on a solution um, that it include Okanagan Lake in terms of Okanagan Centre and uh, Cars <coughs> Landing as well. OK, uh, Councillor Koza. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of more clarify to you, Councillor Ireland, is that uh, it, it is probably totally feasible, uh, but just not at this time. Like right now, we can't even get the canal dredged out and to look at something like that. But I do agree with you. It's not that I don't agree in what you're, what you're saying, but I just don't think it's in our future anytime soon, right, in that location. But uh, I do agree with you, so it's not that I don't agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll wrap it at that and um, get on to the next item. Thank you very much and um, carry on. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Your Worship. Question? Yes. So the next item is uh, uh, zoning amendment uh, bylaw number 1089. Uh, which is also uh, called the Stone Dragonfly Farms application. Uh, this was given three, re three readings uh, in, on March the 3rd, 2020, uh, went through a first, second reading and a public hearing. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the first op staff option is that uh, the uh, bylaw be adopted. Okay. Um, Councillor Gamble, in comment? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I will be voting opposed um, to this application. Uh, it uh, and the reasons are, uh, first of all, I believe there will be a negative impact on the farmland uh, with this nearby density. Uh, secondly, I, I think that this is um, on the fringe of the urban containment area in the District of Lake Country. And uh, if you should study the maps, you'll see that. Uh, we just turned down a, uh, a, a, a development on uh, Macubri Road, uh, which was a similar fringe area. Uh, and uh, thirdly, uh, I believe that um, uh, planning development here at the base of a steep uh, hill 
is, in my opinion, too much density, and I believe it's also unsafe to locate so close to this intersection. All right, thank you. Second, Councillor Arla. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I support this, and I would I would make a motion that we uh, that we uh, go with the staff recommendation. Um, my I've got a couple of points. First point is, as we talked about before, we are desperate for affordable accommodation that's near an elementary school. We have none anywhere. Uh, okay. This was pointed out. Uh, by people in the community involved in the real estate business saying that, you know, the affordability of these places is tremendous and we don't have that kind of inventory in Lake Country and we certainly don't have anything like it within walking distance to a school. Thank you. I need, I need a motion. I don't have a motion on the floor. Well, so you want to move it? Yeah, I, I made that motion when I started. Okay. You know. And a seconder? So, Kenzie, further discussion? Um, I'd just like to finish what I had to say. Oh, sure. Um, this is, I would not, I, you can't compare this development to the one that we just turned down on McCubrey. There is a bus stop outside this development. There is no bus or any kind of transit on McCubrey Road or Okanagan Centre Road West. So again, where we want to have density and homes that you can walk and use for need to be near buses and schools. Um, we don't have any kind of shopping anywheres other than the core of the village so people are still going to need to drive but at least they can walk their kids to school the kids can walk to school uh this, the second off is that the uh, the uh the third point is that should we turn down this development it turns into four homes with four um carriage homes so either which way there's going to be homes built on this lot but those four homes will have separate entrances to Davidson Road as opposed to one entrance. So, you know, either which way we're going to get property there. So uh, my my vote would be for affordable property okay. with one driveway. Moved so, and uh, second. Any, uh, any further discussion? Here now I'll call the question. Those in favor say A. Kara is on chat. I believe that Councillor Reed wants to say something. Councillor Reed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't get to my unmute button quick enough. Um, my question would be maybe staff can advise because I'm, I'm I don't, about to tell me if I'm stepping out of line here, but there was an issue with the fence that was up on that property um, blocking sight lines, and I wondered whether staff had any indication whether it was the intent that that fence remain or is that just while the development continues so um first of all i, I have to say that that's nothing to do with the zoning so uh, okay. uh it is important to keep that in mind however i think that uh, uh director salmon was working on uh, on uh, the measurements of the fence i am pretty sure that the fence is uh, uh, only uh, temporary um, and that uh, when uh, the uh, construction starts, or at that point, probably uh, it will be removed. But we can confirm that. Okay. Um, uh, for, as we had the opportunity to comment, I, I, I kind of agree with both Penny and Blair at the same time. Um, I agree that affordable, sorry, low, um, smaller housing, town housing, because I don't think we can make this statement that it's affordable housing in the true sense of affordable housing. It is town housing, which is traditionally cheaper than single foot family dwellings, but that doesn't equate precisely to the word to how affordable housing is used in a social context. Um, and so I hear the benefit of having town houses because they are a lower cost than single family houses. But equally, I hear Councillor Gamble's comments about the density and the impact. I would feel personally a lot more comfortable with this development if it was a lower number of town houses on that property. So that's where I'm sitting at the moment. So I'm not against the development, but the density, I 
I feel is a little high for that corner to have 20 cars to fam two cars. Families are quite common coming in and out of that intersection. So I support Councillor Arland in the the um, the the usefulness of that housing to the community and the proximity to the school and to the um, transit system. And equally, I hear what Councillor Gamble is saying in terms of the volume of that housing on a busy intersection. Thank you. Um, Councillor McKenzie. No, I'm sorry, Councillor Scarrow. No, I'm just supporting uh, the resolution. I, I believe uh, the three points that Blair put are generally my points. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I will echo that as well. Um, I think the four driveways versus one is a, a big thing for me, and uh, 10 units versus eight, that's not really a huge issue, especially when they're going to be lower cost. So I uh, support this as well. Uh, Councillor Blair, a second time. Uh, hold on. Sorry. Did, can hear you. did you have a comment? Com You're muted now. You're muted. Somebody uh, muted you. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Um, yeah, yeah I, I'd like to emphasize, you know, when, when Kara's talking about the density, we're talking about two homes, four driveways. Two homes or four driveways. And you, you say it's not, not really affordable housing. Well, discussion. A townhouse that's four hundred thousand dollars is three hundred sixty-nine thousand dollars below the cost of a of the average home in Lake Country. So, uh, you know, a, a townhouse is what people can afford, especially Thank young you. people. And uh, if if it, I was a young person with kids, I'd be looking to someplace near a school. So, you know, unless we're prepared to build a school some other place, an elementary school. Uh, I don't believe there's any opportunity to build anything more around Peter Greer. So um, I think this this fits in and is a natural for where it is. Thank you. All right. Councillor Gamble. Thank uh, you. And uh, just just to comment a little bit on uh, on four driveways, um, we have been told that there that is the possibility, but if staff were to look at this and especially looking at the distance from the intersection, uh, it may be that we actually couldn't put four driveways uh, onto the uh, Davidson Road. Um, just looking at where they would be, they would be very, very close to the intersection if you know that road. Um, and it is a very steep hill. Uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that uh, uh, could create real safety problems in winter, uh, which is one of the main reasons that I think that, uh, and this was raised by many people, by the way, at uh, at the uh, at the public input session. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I really think that that is not in our best interest. As far as affordability, I think uh, uh, Councillor Reid talked about uh, affordability. In fact, uh, townhouses. Uh, we have a number of townhouses in Lake Country that right now are nearly six hundred thousand um, dollars. So um, I don't know that that's very affordable. Most of them are are very small, two or three bedrooms. Uh, so I think that um, uh, looking at this, it isn't in the best interest of the community to locate this density here. And it would seem to me on the fringe of development is not where you're going to put the highest density. The highest density, in, in my opinion, or the higher densities, um, if you're doing good urban planning, would seem to me to be much nearer the town centre area um, so that you've got a much more compact community, well serviced. Thank you. Um, we're repeating ourselves. Councillor Reader, you... It, it's, a, it's a new question, I promise. Um, so I wasn't there at the meeting on the 3rd of March. So, um, Councillor Arnold, you mentioned the 40, 400,000 was the price tag. Was that, is that confirmed? Is that something that the developer has committed to, to, to that price? Um, that, that's, I'm sure it's market, but uh, that, that was what we, we went to the public hearing with that. And that's what we're basically. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly what the uh, three readings on targeting. And uh, the the uh, 
the um, a fellow that got up and spoke, who, who's not their agent, but he's a real estate agent, um, got up and spoke and uh, and talked about that price range. Absolutely, okay. and that there's not okay. that many pieces in that price range. I'll call the question. Uh, those in favor of adoption. One, two, three, four. Bills in favor. Okay. Opposed. Uh, so I'm opposed. <laughs> opposed. Three, three opposed. I'm in favor. Uh, Just motion carried. So for adoption. Thank you. Who, uh, Councillor Gamble, Reed, and uh, Koza opposed. All right. Moving on. Oh, public comment. How, how are we doing public comment? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So for public comment, uh, anybody that is physically in attendance is welcome to come to the podium and speak to council. We will also be posting a phone number All on right. the yeah. live feed um, right now. And any members of the public that are watching when it comes up. <laughs> will be able to call into this number and uh, they will be greeted and we will take their comments. There is about a 30 second delay for this phone number to show up on the live feed. So we'll give it 30 seconds and uh, and if there's any other public comment, but. Uh. Raina, Raina, uh, your worship, uh, just to make sure that the, the public uh, uh, a member of the pub, members of the public that are uh, watching this, they understand that the 15 minutes is total uh, for the public comment section of this agenda. I don't hear anyone shut it down. <laughs> Can councillors phone in? No. You get to comment all the time. Anybody wish to address council? Hearing none. Anybody in no telephone calls? 30 seconds up. Give me another minute or so. I suppose we could get on with it and if somebody calls in, they can ask, they can comment. How would that work? Uh, that could work. We could, uh, we would see them calling in and we would ask them uh, which item on the agenda for public comment that they wanted to speak to. So we can uh, continue on if, if mm -hmm. that's the chair's say. Really good. Um, all right, we'll get to the temporary use item nine. And uh, anybody into, oh, uh, I can't sort of best. <laughs> Planner. Thank you. Good evening. Microphone on. Again. Can you? Yeah. Yeah. Just wait for the presentation. You have to. You have somebody? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you do it off by heart. <laughs> yeah. It goes on the big screen. Uh, Your ship, this application is for a temporary permit on Camp Road. It's zoned RR1, Rural Residential 1, and OCP Rural Residential. And the application is for a temporary permit for a home-based business that produces raw dog food. Say next slide. Okay, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the location of the approximately seven acre property, uh, Panhandle Access. Next slide, please. And uh, 
air photo showing the main residence, a uh, workshop and a shed on the property and the business will be operating from the main residence. Next slide, please. This uh, slide shows the approximate uh, distances to the immediately adjacent properties uh, from where the business will be operating. Next slide, next slide, please. Um, previous slide. Couple of site photos. The first one shows the residence. Um, the second one shows uh, the north property boundary, or sorry, the south one. Next slide, please. Um, the first photo on the slide shows the property line to the north and um, the distance to the property line. And <clears throat> the bottom photograph shows the access into the property as well as the east property line. And um, the photo to the right shows where the business will be operating within the residence. So it will be within the kitchen of the residence and it also shows the tools that will be used. Next slide. In terms of the background, the owner of the home-based business has been approved for operating the business by Interior Health. However, um, as Section 10.4.7 of the Zoning Bylaw specifically prohibits the cutting, wrapping, processing, or smoking of meat, wild game, or fish, when the applicant applied for a business license, the owner was informed that she needed to be considered by council for a temporary permit. Next slide. So this, um, as mentioned earlier, is for a home-based business uh, that will be producing and packaging raw dog food from home, and it will use pre-butchered BC beef, as well as a small quantity of local fruits and vegetables. It is a small-scale business, and there will be no additional employees, and all transportation of the raw material to the home, as well as the finished products, will be done by using the family van. The meat will be processed and packaged in the kitchen of the main residence using a non-commercial meat grinder, a vacuum packaging machine, as well as some other tools. The maximum floor area for residential home occupation is 25% of the total floor area, up to a maximum of 40 meters square. And the proposed area for this business is 13.5 meters square, which is the area of the kitchen and this complies with the area restrictions in the zoning bylaw. Next slide. Um, staff does not see any foreseeable negative impacts as a result of this application being approved. The effects on traffic and the number of trips on Camp Road will be negligible given the scale of the business. The applicant has noted that all noise and odors will be contained within the residence and there is sufficient distance to adjacent residences in terms of waste disposal, um, the applicant has noted that all recycling will be taken to the Glenmore Recycling Facility. Any fat trimmed from the meat is fed to the applicant's dog, so it does not need to be disposed of. And waste from the, fr um, waste from the fruits and vegetables uh, will be composted on the site um, using a compost bin and the vermicompost system. Um, this, uh, approving this permit also facilitates the operation of a local business, adding to the economy and allowing the applicant to be self-employed. And pet owners and pet stores will be able to locally source dog food. Next slide. Preferred staff option is that the temporary use permit be approved and subject to the conditions listed in the temporary use permit for a period of up to three years. And option B on the next slide is that the temporary permit be denied. All right, thank you. Any comments for questions? Um, motion? Moved. Uh, Councillor Scarra moved. Uh, oh, I, oh, I have to ask if there's anybody from the public. I'm sorry. Uh, anybody here that uh, wish to address this? Anybody uh, at home wishes to address this? And then uh, the applicant is here. All right. Um, I have Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was actually curious if the applicant was here as well, and she is sitting here. Uh, so 
um, being somebody who has processed meat before, um, I know there's uh, a little bit of smell involved if you're not taking care of it. So I just, you had in there that it's all internal. I just, that would be the question is just what, uh, I'm sick how big of a scale is it as far as for meat purposes? Um, if you would come to the microphone and give, state your name and speak into the microphone. Yep, Thank I'm you. Tracy Arsenal. Um, it's small scale. I don't know what the demand is going to be. Um, there's absolutely no point for me to go and rent industrial space and then find out that, you know, I've got four or five, six people that are interested. It's something I believe in that I do for my own dogs anyway. I feed my own dogs the raw food. Um, so it's a case of start small, see how it goes. And if it is something that's going to be big is then we take it out of the house and it goes to industrial premises. But it's just basically right now I'm dipping a toe in the water to see if I can make this work. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, you know, I fully support um, this type of business and um, I'm the self-employed version as well. So. Um, I do uh, want to see you succeed in this. I just was curious on uh, what your plan was. So it's nice to hear the comments. So thank you. Yeah, and, uh, great, thank you. Um, Councillor Reed may have a question for you. Um, thank you. Yes, I do have a question for the African. Thank you for braving the outside world and being here today. Um, my question would be, um, Two, well, two questions. The first one is, do you currently have a compost bin on the property? And has there been, if so, has there been any problems with bears? Because I noted from your application that the um, vegetable waste was going to be disposed of um, in that form. Yes, I do have a compost bin. In one of the photographs that looks straight down at the front of my house, there's actually a fenced structure. I have a garden and mm -hmm. we have a big problem with deer. So I have um, a six foot high um, deer fence all around my garden and the compost bin is in there. I also use vermicompost, so um, composting with worms, like we have the plant down here in Winfield, do it on a smaller scale, um, fruit, vegetable scraps only, you have a certain special type of worm and they turn it into um, a compost too. So I have two methods of doing it, the traditional compost which is fenced away. Nothing can get into that. OK, thank you. Um, my second question was when we are looking at storing both the um, pre-slaughtered, the slaughtered meat and ready for preparation, and then also the, the raw dog for ready for collection or shipping, is that going to be stored inside the house or is it going to be stored outside in a, in again, in a, in a shed or an outbuilding? And again, the question is, would it be an attractant for, for wildlife? No, it will be stored in the garage. Um, there'll be fridges and freezers in the garage. So because I, I, they're not in my house, they won't be in my personal fridge or freezer. Um, mm -hmm. Everything is, will be dedicated. The grinder and the tools you'll see are not what I use for my family. Um, they're set aside. Um, fridges and freezers, as the stuff comes in, it gets processed straight away. It's a fresh meat, frozen meat. It's a product that has a limited life. So it gets um, turned into dog food, mixed up straight away and frozen straight away. It's uh, be sold as a frozen product, not a right. fresh. That's reassuring. I, I work in veterinary medicine, so I know what a, uh, you know some of the contaminants that raw meat can cause. And I was really pleased to see that you've been signed off by um, Interior Health. Um, and my, my final question um, would be at what point, of, how many visitors a week would you, at which point would you switch to a, an industrial premise? I guess it's the point at which I say, right, I physically don't have the space. And I think the space will be determined by the space I need will be the storage space, fridges and freezers. Um, when I find that I'm needing to get more product than I can store or that I'm making more than I can store within, you know, a few fridges and freezers, then it's time to look elsewhere. How would you feel if your neighbours, because I noticed your driveway is very close to, to one of the houses, I think it's 1674, and I, I don't think we've heard from them, but what would happen if they felt that the, the amount of traffic 
down that driveway was was impinging on their quality of life is that something that you would consider that as a as a motivator to move to a an industrial premise no because i don't think that'll be an issue um the product will be brought in either in my van or my husband's pickup and that'll be done once twice a week um the idea is not that i will have people coming down to the house okay it will be mainly deliveries you know there might be the odd person one or two a week but the idea is that i don't want people in and out of my property all the time i will take it to them thank you very much i appreciate your answers uh councillor gamble thank you and i just have a, another uh question for the applicant um, you've answered quite a few of my concerns um, i was more concerned about the waste uh, it sounds like the material itself that you're producing is going to be in the freezer indoors, so that should not create a problem um, from that point of view. But it, it is the waste I was concerned about, and uh, we, we've we heard of cougars in the area. I'm more concerned about that kind of wildlife, uh, especially you mentioned deer, and deer are certainly rambling around our community quite a bit. Um, and along with them, there's the odd cougar. Uh, and I'm just wondering um, uh, about the smell that's being created or what you expect will be created by the waste. It sounds like you won't have much meat on that, but there will be a, probably the odd little bit and whether or not that would become a problem. That was what I was concerned about. The smell, when I say that be, the smell is contained in the property. The smell is actually contained itself. Um, what I like for my dog to use stripes, and uh, it does not smell very pleasant. But if I'm doing it in my kitchen, you can walk right past the front of my house with my windows open and you won't know that anything is going on. It's just unpleasant when you're putting it in the grinder, the smell of it. The tripe that stinks, smells, um, won't be going in the garbage at all. That is my product. So that's what gets frozen and uh, sold as dog food. There's sometimes you'll find there's a little bit of fat and that goes to my dogs. Um, everything else that I come in is actually product that is used. There's not, I'm not butchering. It's already been butchered. So it's not like I'm pulling waste off of bones and stuff like that, that all has to be disposed of. There really is very little, like I say, vegetable peelings, um, you know, the trimming of fruit and veg, that will be composted and then so the meat just about everything is used and what isn't used in won't be used to sell is what goes to my dogs i hope that answers your question there won't be meat products going in the outside garbage yes thanks that's good appreciate uh, that Councillor councillor oh sorry um uh, corporate has a comment Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just before moving on, just to let uh, Mayor and Council know that one letter of support was received. I believe it was from a neighbouring property, although I'm not sure to which side. And there was one letter of opposition received. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> uh, Councillor Koza. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, I just want to show nothing but a huge amount of support for this type of endeavor. If it's done properly and, the, and they're cleaning it up and everything like that, it can only be great. And in these days of COVID now, it's uh, buy local, shop local, support local. So I have nothing but support for this and uh, I, I hope you have great success. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Arla. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, to, to me, it's like to unmute there. Uh, yeah, I uh, I agree with Councillor Kozub and some of the other comments. Um, you know, we wish you great success. I think this is it's a great plan, and it, it's good to see that you you're thinking of the future of if this is successful and you you need to move it out and you move it into a industrial area. That's that's great to see that you're looking like that. Um, and uh, that one letter of support is actually from the nearest neighbor. So uh, uh, that that's good to see. That that's uh, that's right next door. It's uh, so yeah. Thank you. Uh, Supportive. One hundred percent. Nobody from the public phoned in, or nobody else from the public to uh, comment. So I'll take a motion from council. 
Councillor McKenzie and uh, Councillor Kozum. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Hearing none opposed, motion carries. Thank you very much. And uh, we're done with that. Uh, strategic priorities. Uh, Your Worship, we have another item before that. It is the uh, policy directive from the province with respect to uh, expanded service area uh, for pubs and uh, wineries. So uh, this is actually uh, Director McEwen's uh, item, but since he's not here, I will uh, I will introduce uh, the presentation. I guess it's a small presentation just to uh, clarify what uh, we have here. So, Kate, you should be able to see it. If you, can you confirm that? It's showing on this screen in the council chambers. Mm -hmm. I hope it shows on the other uh, screens as well. Yep, we got it here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so there is an echo there, but uh, I'll go. Uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, so, as a result of uh, COVID-19 and uh, uh, the uh, uh, BC uh, restart uh, plan that was introduced by uh, Premier Horgan uh, in May, um, businesses have received uh, an opportunity to reopen uh, certain activities uh, based on plans that they have to do. Now, in order to meet some of the requirements uh, for uh, distancing, uh, in, in order to protect both the, uh, the staff um, at the premises, but also the uh, uh, the consumers, um, the uh, liquor um, control and ca uh, cannabis liquor cannabis uh, uh, board of BC has. Uh, issued a directive which is called uh, the Directive 2013, uh, basically uh, uh, to help uh, uh, license capacity, uh, licensees such as pubs and wineries to expand their service, serving areas to ensure physical distancing. Now, licensees may apply to expand on their own uh, or the local government is given an opportunity to expedite the process by providing uh, what we call a blanket approval. Uh, knowing uh, all licensees, basically, they must still adhere to local bylaws. Now, um, one of the reasons why we're here is because we believe that uh, a uh, blanket approach uh, will probably ensure licensees to reopen in a timely manner, uh, as the deadline for this uh, uh, directive to expire is actually October 31st, uh, 2020. Uh, and so uh, one off applications usually take uh, a, a much longer time for us to go through uh, the referral process for applicants. Um, so uh, we, we see that uh, uh, there is an advantage to take a, a wider approach uh, based on the directive, which we have done with other applications in other uh, areas with respect to bu uh, building permits and uh, development permits and so on. So. Um, I guess what we're asking council to consider is whether they wish to provide this blanket pre-approval and expedite the process of reopenings, which will be monitored by the planning and development department. Uh, you have a copy of the directive uh, on your screen. I'm not going to go through it. Uh, you can, uh, we, we sent this uh, uh, beforehand uh, to council today, knowing that uh, uh, Jamie will not uh, wouldn't be here. Uh, and so the staff's preferred option is that in response to the uh, LCRB uh, policy directive 2013, which was issued actually May 22nd, 2020, support is provided for blanket approval of temporary expanded service area, also authorization until October 31st, 2020 for all food primary, liquor primary and manufacturer licensees Thereby, thereby supporting timely reopening of businesses and physical distancing measures. Now, we didn't know anything about this until probably a few days ago when we were uh, actually uh, approached by uh, a couple of uh, uh, licensees 
um, within the, within our community. But I believe that uh, the uh, uh, COADC uh, had some discussion about this uh, last week, probably. So it's before council. I hope that uh, you know I, I may not have all the uh, answers to questions, but uh, I'm here to attempt uh, to do so uh, in the absence of uh, Jamie McEwen. Um, Councillor Ireland had a question. Actually, I, I don't have a question here. Uh, what I would say is that I, I'd like to move the staff recommendation. I think we need to uh, to help these businesses get back moving. Uh, any kind of business that we can help, we need to help uh, get back moving and, and try to get our economy back to where it was. And that, that's not going to be an easy task. And if we can uh, if we can lighten the load and make it easy, I think that's absolutely what we have to do. Very good, thank you, Councilor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll uh, second that, and as well, um, I echo those comments. Um, I love the the um, statement from our uh, presenter, the first one saying that we're oversaturated with emergencies. Mm -hmm. Love that one. Um, and in this case, it'd be something positive. And I think uh, that's exactly what our local businesses need is um, some positive. So I fully support whatever it takes to um, get them up and going and make this work for them. And uh, I've also been in contact with local businesses about this and they're looking for um, direction from what we can do. And I have um, I have a City of Kelowna version of what they have already done on this coming. And so as soon as I get that, I'll forward it on to everybody else. Very good. Thank you. Um, corporate has a comment. I would just like to read the resolution out for Council's information for those that haven't seen it. Uh, it reads that in response to Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch Policy Directive Number 20-13, issued May 22nd, 2020. Support is provided for blanket approval of temporary expanded service area authorization until October 31st, 2020 for all food primary, liquor primary, and manufacturer licenses, thereby, thereby supporting timely reopening of businesses and physical distancing measures. All right. Any further discussion? Oh, uh for read. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry, my question was, what exactly are we giving blanket approval for? Because does this mean that they can expand to anywhere on their property to uh, provide the additional space? Is it is there any restrictions on how close they are to neighbours um, in terms of expanding their property? I have no issue at all with a blanket approval, but I just think at the moment, we're not. I, I just don't know what it would look like if we said yes. So uh, my understanding is that obviously um, hours of operation and uh, capacity, uh, current capacity within the license must be uh, uh, complied with. So the first thing that uh, these uh, uh, establishments need to do is to uh, provide sufficient uh, uh, distancing within the establishment um, to accommodate those first and then uh, the remaining number that they have can be accommodated outside or outdoors uh, within uh, the parameters that uh, they have. Um, so there is no increase in capacity and there is no, uh, no difference uh, uh, from the license that they have. Uh, they're just having an opportunity to uh, take outdoors uh, what they can't contain within the premises. Are, are they limited by the 50 people maximum in terms of the public health instructions from Dr. Bonnie Henry as churches and other facilities are? Yes, they are. Uh, that's uh, part of uh, the order. Um, and in fact, um, they can't have more than 50 between inside and outside. So they can't have all of them outside. They have to have a combination of both. OK, that's is it possible to reference the public health requirements in the motion to say that it would be local bylaws and public health orders or did I miss that already? I think uh, I think uh, we, we can edit. OK. 
that would be a friendly amendment, so we need we do not need an amendment. We just that. And presumably, if the liquor board rescinded that due to a second wave, for God forbid, but if it was, then that would be something that the liquor board would do. We don't need to concern ourselves with that. Correct. And, uh, and uh, there is uh, there is a, an expiry date to this, which is October 31st. So after that, everything will uh, return to uh, uh, previous conditions. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah. All right. The motion then is amended. Or was it amended? No, there was no amendment. Uh, we, uh, we will include in the motion uh, mentioned to the uh, uh, current uh, provincial orders from the medical officer right. to, be, to be complied with. Right. Oh. Great. All right. And those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None opposed? Motion carried. Good. Thank you. Moving on. Strategic priority update. You're doing that? Who's doing that? I am again, so you have to suffer through me throughout the night. Um, so uh, this uh, report was uh, uh, presented to you and submitted to you as part of the agenda package. Let me see if I can actually uh, show you the report. The benefit to the public as well. Um, so I will uh, share my screen again. If you don't mind. Um, yeah, I don't uh, have the ability for some reason to share my screen again. Oh, here. Okay. Now you should be able to see the report this time. You can confirm that. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, we do this on a regular basis, except that last time, um, because of the restrictions uh, imposed through uh, the COVID-19 um, lockdown, I guess, uh, we weren't able to have a uh, open session and a number of uh, the um, actions that uh, we uh, were going to take with respect to uh, uh, the strategic priorities um, did not have a specific date or were put on hold because of we didn't know when uh, we could uh, resume regular business. Now, because obviously uh, we have reopened for business, so to speak, um, we have decided to uh, um, update the, the strategic priorities list and provide uh, uh, opportunities to uh, move forward with a number of uh, of the priorities that we have on the, that list. Uh, now, um, there's still two or three of these uh, priorities that uh, we're not able to pinpoint a date, uh, but I guess we have enough uh, for the next couple of months to uh, uh, to fill the agenda and uh, to uh, move on a number of these things. Uh, in the month of June, starting on the 9th, uh, we're going to have uh, a number of uh, uh, strategy sessions where we're going to discuss a number of uh, items that uh, we will need in order to uh, get direction from council and move forward. And I made a list uh, for your information and uh, uh, basically uh, if you see the list in the council uh, uh, report, um, you will uh, see that uh, um, pretty much everything is taken care of. Uh, mobility for tomorrow, for instance, is not because, as you recall, we had uh, we were trying to uh, um, have uh, uh, Jill Penalosa to uh, uh, come and um, and do a workshop with council, and, uh, and we still think that's that that is important to us. Uh, but obviously, at this point, we really don't know when we can do that. Uh, things have changed for him as as well for the rest. Uh, uh, of, uh, of Canada and the district. So we are going to uh, uh, to establish that in the next uh, uh, month or so and we'll find out and uh, we'll uh, report back on that. Uh, the rest, uh, there is an economic development strategy now. The uh, uh, the only reason why 
uh, there is a TBD there is because there are changes in organizational responsibility with respect to the economic development function that are now uh, that is now assigned uh, that function is now assigned to uh, 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 Matt Vader. And uh, uh, there is a draft, by the way, that was put together by Jamie uh, McEwen. And so as soon as uh, uh, Matt and his group are going, uh, are reviewing or review uh, the, uh, um, the draft agenda or the draft uh, strategy, uh, they will set up a time for council to review. Um, some of this, these things have been completed. Uh, some have been rearranged. Uh, in, some have been rearranged to make sure that uh, uh, they match uh, the work that has been done by staff. Um, um, the new collective agreement is another one that is pending update on pandemic response. Um, so we don't know yet. I mean, like uh, communications between obviously the uh, um, uh, the employer and uh, the union um, have been put on hold. Uh, but, you know, we're slowly getting back to uh, uh, normality and so at some point we'll probably resume uh, discussions with them. Um, I think uh, I think that covers pretty much everything. As you can see, there's a lot of stuff coming up uh, on, in June and July. And uh, we're going to try to use as much, as many uh, Tuesdays as we can in order to uh, alleviate the backlog here. Um, so you have to bear with us and, uh, and go from there. Thank so we're you. asking that uh, this update be uh, formally approved by council. Thank you. Um, Councillor Gamble. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, when I looked at this, um, I, I, I was a little concerned um, because I, I am concerned about uh, the economic recovery uh, that we will be going through in our community, as most communities will. And um, I'm just uh, wondering, are we actually, I mean, it's a little early in the process, and I do recognize that, but I know that we like to plan ahead. And I'm wondering if we're monitoring the kind of the state of the economy in our community, um, knowing that numerous communities are losing um, renters uh, from their business uh, spaces as uh, as people find that they are are just not able to make a go of it um, i don't know what the situation is in our community but um, if this covid 19 goes on a lot longer if we do get a second wave uh, there will be some serious uh, ramifications i think um, and I'm just I'm just thinking ahead here. How are we going to uh, look at this? And um, and and you know we did have an economic development strategy that was you know some time before COVID came along. So I'm just I'm just asking what are we doing? How are we looking ahead here? So uh, we we don't do economic development in isolation, although obviously we, we look at uh, our community interest first, uh, but we're working with uh, the rest of the region to uh, bring back uh, the economy to a level that is satisfactory uh, to uh, uh, the business community. Uh, so we've been working with COADC on this, and uh, there is actually a task force of the mayors uh, in the region it was created uh, um, about uh, three weeks ago and there is a meeting tomorrow that is happening and uh, um, the mayor and I and Matt will participate to that and uh, and will uh, uh, and uh, will report back I guess uh, to council uh, about some of the plans that they have uh, in mind. Now yes there is an existing economic development strategy that has been uh, uh, in place for a number of years. Uh, we're just, uh, the one that you see in the strategic priorities list is uh, an update of that strategy. Um, so we're not abandoning the, uh, the, the, the current one. We're just uh, working on updating the, uh, that one uh, with uh, new things. And I'm not talking about uh, two or three months here. We're talking about weeks until we can actually come back to council and present a draft. It's just that, uh, you know, with the changes in uh, staffing, 
uh, they need to familiarize with uh, uh, the files that they have uh, received from Jamie. There's been already a couple of meetings with uh, both uh, Matt and Ruth, and uh, we have talked also to uh, the Chambers of uh, the Chamber of Commerce um, about some of the changes we're making at the staff level. And uh, Jennifer has been very gracious. Uh, uh, Jennifer Madsen, uh, the, the president of the chamber, uh, has been very gracious to uh, um, uh, help us in uh, identifying some uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, points that uh, need to be discussed. And uh, we're going to be uh, working a meeting with them to uh, uh, to move ahead and move forward uh, to make sure that uh, uh, if anything happens again, obviously we are prepared. All right, thank you. Um, You're muted. Councillor, I am? No. Uh, Councillor Gamble is muted. Oh, uh, Councillor. Sorry, oh. <laughs> I was talking. I didn't realize I was muted again. Um, uh, and I must have done it myself. That's even worse. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, tourism is, is heavily impacted. And, uh, you know, just hearing uh, recently that uh, the airport itself was down 96% in volume this last while. Uh, that has a huge impact on our community as well as the region and um, you know how we're going to move forward and get through the next couple of years is going to be you know interesting and I, and I hope that we are going to keep sight of that. So Absolutely. and I think you definitely got hands on so that's great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Reid. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Alberto. It, it was also to um, Councillor Gamble's point about the handover um, and obviously the sound of need of a of a post-COVID um, short-term strategy and then a longer-term strategy for the district. But um, could I ask that maybe Matt um, reach out to the other members of the Economic Development uh, Committee before presenting to Council just to get the group um, keep group engagement on that, particularly uh, the chair um, and some of the other members, maybe outside of the chamber, um, certainly UBCO and tourism, as um, uh, Councillor Gambles mentioned. I think it, just to keep that engagement going and to uh, ensure that what comes forward from strategy um, ha has been talked through with them. I know where we where we left it was relatively high level um, and there was still work to be done to fleshing it out. So I think I would appreciate if the committee could be engaged in some form before it comes to council. Yeah, and uh, and that is uh, what we usually do. Uh, so uh, what, uh, um, yeah, we, we didn't give all the details obviously of uh, uh, what's in that list, but uh, you know, our, um, I guess the next step would be for the new uh, the new economic development group uh, to uh, uh, set up a meeting of the committee, introduce themselves, have an opportunity to hear uh, what uh, the major issues they, they see for the community and uh, probably uh, uh, work out uh, some of the uh, details of the uh, uh, economic development strategy. Uh, and at one point when, uh, when they're comfortable, we will know when uh, we can target the strategy session for council. That that will obviously include the Chamber of Commerce, uh, tourism, oper tourism operators, which includes tourism, Kelowna and Tola, uh, and a bunch of other uh, business people that uh, uh, either are on the committee or have been uh, uh, working with us on a number of issues. And uh, um, it's, uh, yeah, we, we are very concerned about uh, the ramifications of COVID-19 uh, for the community. Uh, especially for the business community, because we are we're not a huge uh, community in the first place. So uh, we need to help each other, and uh, and so we need to uh, take a close look at uh, uh, how we can help actually uh, the business community here. Uh, it's it's extremely important. Now tonight you have uh, done, um, I believe, a good thing to help uh, the tourism industry with. Uh, um, opening up uh, to the uh, um, uh, expansion of the uh, uh, outdoor activities uh, uh, of uh, uh, businesses like pubs and wineries. I think uh, that's obviously in concert with uh, the province, uh, but I think it's important that we recognize 
that is probably uh, something that we need to do in any case. I mean, like uh, uh, we have been trying hard to help the uh, um, development community uh, to, to keep going with their uh, construction uh, business. But I think uh, as, uh, as Penny mentioned, it's important that we recognize also the tourism industry, which is fundamental to uh, what we do uh, and from an economic development standpoint. And, uh, and I think uh, we, we have to reach out to all the aspects of the, and all areas of business in the, in the community. So yeah, um, this is what we're doing. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I need a motion. Uh, oh, pardon? Uh, not for the uh, to accept the update. No. Uh, Councillor Reed and uh, Councillor Scarrow. Uh, those in favor? No. Motion carries. Thank you. I None thought Okay. And the community complex joint operating agreement. Repealing by law, uh, corporate. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is just a housekeeping item. It's a bylaw that's been sitting on the books. We have an agreement in place and this bylaw is no longer required. Moved. And so do the first second. Seconded. Second. Moved. Uh, Councillor Gamble and Councillor who was it? Ireland? Those sure. Opposed? Motion carries. Good. Do you need one to introduce a new motion? No. Um, report from in camera. Is that happening? Uh, no, there's nothing on this agenda to report from in camera. That's a standing agenda item for okay. any items that may I be I thought there was uh, an item coming up. Nope. No. Okay. Good. So we're down to councillor items. Councillor, way over there, Mackenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, don't have a whole lot uh, to add. Uh, I said it during the meeting in regards to business and stuff. I really do feel strongly that we need to support uh, business and help them as much as possible to get through this. Um, and like I say, I'm just uh, was sending out a, an example of what Kelowna is using to um, for the pubs and stuff to try and uh, help them out, pubs and restaurants. So um, I'm hoping uh, we can make it work for them and uh, try not to disrupt our community as much as possible in the meantime. So thanks. Really good. Thank you, Councillor Timber. Well. I think basically the only thing I talk about is um, how our school and grad is going, which is sort of interesting because of the whole um, COVID and social distancing and whatnot. We are actually kind of going back, but it, it's it's very weird because the basically the school district keeps rearranging the schedule, um, which is sort of interesting. But we are well, like. Uh, at first, we were um, doing um, Zoom lessons online for four days a week, and then we on Friday we could like schedule things with teachers on Zoom to uh, fit, to get extra help. And now we're instead doing Zoom classes on Monday and Wednesday, but twice as many on each day, and we can actually go into the school on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays for extra help. So they just keep rearranging it on us, which is. <laughs> A bit of annoying, but we're still planning our uh, grad thing where we're going to pull out the red carpet and arrive in groups so that we never have more than 50 people um, as a gathering uh, to do the actual <laughs> walk down a red carpet, get a diploma, that kind of thing. So well, that's coming up. All right, good. And Councillor Stangerberg. Um, seeing that it's the last meeting that I would probably, um, I just want to uh, share some thoughts with you guys. So I'd like to um, thank all the councillors and the mayor and the staff for having both Kieran and I here. I think it's been a great year for both of us. Very interesting and we learned a lot, I think. Um, and I just like to um, share some other thoughts that I have with you guys. So um, during this last year, this past year, I've repeatedly advocated for district ride ban on plastic, single-use plastic bags with no success so far. 
Um, it baffles my mind that we're waiting on the federal government to initiate this when plastics take hundreds of years to break down. The fact that we are still handing them out as if there's no tomorrow clearly shows our system's priorities. If you are someone that disagrees with climate change, I respect your opinion, but I think we can all see that our oceans are full of plastic. Um, air pollution is being encouraged by the corporate welfare fossil fuel companies receive in this country. And our endangered species list is growing so rapidly, Homo sapien may soon join the 40,000 dying species if system changes don't occur now. I've been to the Arctic and stood on the bare lands of lost glaciers and heard about the devastation from local Inuit elders. Everything you say on TV. We are living through unprecedented times during this pandemic, but we must not lose sight of what will be an even greater, greater tragic threat to humanity if system changes don't occur now. Every day we're destroying the only planet we have in the blind pursuit of economic growth, yet this entire financial system will be utterly useless when this planet becomes inhabitable. Unlike COVID-19, there will never be a vaccine for climate change, yet we are still turning a blind eye. I speak for my generation and all future generations when I demand the municipal, provincial and federal government to stop making excuses, step up to prioritize our environment and finally do better. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Gamble. OK, thanks. Finally got that. Um, I appreciate what Leone has said and uh, I feel guilty, uh, but I also feel that uh, it is through listening to people like Leone that we will actually make this change. Um, I know that uh, when I have picked up my groceries in the last two months with COVID, I picked them up in plastic bags and, uh, and I'm saving my bags now to take them to, where do I have to take them? Mm -hmm. To Glenmore. We've asked that they be at least be able to deposit it locally, but that hasn't happened yet. And that at least would mean that people actually would save the plastic bags. They could be used into used for something. But the fact is they are very bad for the environment. And I applaud you, uh, Leone, and your leadership at this table where you have tried to stimulate us and make us make that change. Um, I wanted to say thanks to both you, both of you um, uh, coming to this table and representing uh, your school um, for the grads uh, this year. And I think you've really made made us all proud by a lot of the comments that you've made. So I, I personally want to thank you and thank you on behalf of all of us counselors. Um, I also want to congratulate all the grads and my oldest granddaughter is graduating with uh, you all, Rayanne McHugh. I'm very proud of her and I'm very excited that they are going to do a small ceremony uh, uh, this weekend. Uh, it should have been a big party and dance and <laughs> I'm sorry it isn't, but we got to take what it is and appreciate that you have all reached a wonderful milestone in your life and really just the start of your future. Um, that's mainly what I wanted to say. Um, I think we've talked about a lot of issues tonight and it's been a, a great meeting. So thanks all. Thank you. Councillor Ireland. It takes too long to unmute this microphone. I can tell you that. <laughs> I thought I was good at this computer. Um, yeah, I, Councillor Gamble made some great points about what Leone had to say, and and uh, I too would like to thank them for the for the outstanding job that they've done this year in in uh, promoting youth and promoting the thoughts of youth, and and uh, I I agree. I I feel guilty. Every time I go to, I mean, I honestly, I've got a sneaky way around not taking plastic bags. We just ask for boxes, and they are, nine times out of ten will give you a box. And at least it's cardboard and can be recycled because saving the bag and taking it to recycling doesn't really actually do any good because they don't actually recycle those bags. But, um, anyways, Leonia and, uh, and well, both of you guys have done a tremendous job, and we really thank you for your input and hope you have a as good a grad as that you can have. Um, we're all, you know, I'm also very sorry that you don't get to do that. Uh, 
I'm going through that with my daughter who's graduating from university uh, virtually, <laughs> some sort of virtual celebration on the 17th. So, you know, it, it's impacting a lot of Lake Country. Well, it's impacting youth all over. But um, we obviously feel sorry for our group of, of youth and because uh, you're the future. So thank you so much for the great job that you've done and uh, and being vocal all the time because that, that's awesome. It's just so awesome and gives us a lot of hope for the future that um, people are going to stick up for the things that they believe in. And I think that's really important. So, Okay, thank you. Councillor Kozel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would as well like to uh, thank the youth councillors for all the work they do. Uh, youth leadership is a great thing. I was heavily involved in scouting and uh, attained my uh, Silver Duke of Edinburgh Award. So youth leadership was always something that that uh, I always did. And uh, looks like we're coming out of the other side of this COVID. So we just all still have to just be wary and be safe. We don't want us to have a second resurgence. I watch what's happening in the US with horror, with complete and utter horror. Um, I, I don't think that it's over for them yet at all, but uh, I just hope the best for all of us. Today was my first day back at work after 65 days. Well, and I've never had that before in my life. So that was just an eye awakening experience to be sent home and not be able to go anywhere like you're grounded for two months. So I, I pretty much fixed up every little broken bit of my house that you could imagine. <laughs> so, but I just like to say, I hope to see you all next week or in the next few weeks, once we're through the other side of this and I'll stay safe and thank you to the councillors. Thank you. Councillor Reed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Thank you to our youth councillors um, and your passion. I, I, I think it's amazing that you dedicated so much time to the, to the council and the community on top of your final years of schooling with all the work that that involves. And uh, you've planted a seed. I think uh, there's definitely, you spoke to, you know, the things you said have, have resonated with the council. And I, I think it might take time, but I, I'm sure we're gonna carry on and hear your voice um, long after you've left in our discussions. There'll be always something in the back of our minds with you guys piping up on climate change and uh, sustainability. Um, and I think this, uh, what we're going through now in terms of COVID-19 um, gives everybody a pause in their lives, sometimes an unwanted pause for sure, but to reflect on what's important. And, uh, you know, we're seeing a decreased use of cars and uh, carbon emissions. And, and it is an ideal time to start investing in green technologies as everything uh, restarts up in this uh, this new world and I hope that things like our economic development strategy can be part of that and that we look to green technology and uh, the mobility strategy to carry forward some of the ideas that you've planted with this council so thank you for that. Yes thank you and Councillor Scarrow. Mm. There we are how are you guys? I would uh, like to tell you a little bit I can remember what my grandfather was like and what was taught to him. And I can remember what my father was like and what his family taught to him. And I definitely know what he tried to teach to me. And listening to those two youth counselors speak, mm -hmm. our world is going in the right direction and is in very positive, solid hands. And I like the way thinking has evolved and it's going to address all of our major issues within this country, including racism, including the environment and including our culture. I think that our hands are, we're in great hands with the way that those two counselors have taught me that they think and I appreciate them endlessly. Outside of that, thanks for a great meeting you guys. Good night. Very good. And um, again, thanks to the youth counselors and all the best in your future endeavors and studies and um, we'll uh, watch you set the world on fire, not literally, virtually. <laughs> but, um, that comes after the floods, James. We uh, we are adjourned, and I think we're meeting a special council on the 16th. Oh, are we? Anybody know? We're having a uh, in Tamara or no uh, special strategy council? on the ninth. Or not. I can't, yeah. Well, there will be a in-camera meeting, a strategy session, and a regular council meeting on Tuesday the 16th. And it's happening on we the 9th. Have, we have a strategy session on the 9th. Okay. Okay. 
Very good. And we are adjourned. Good night, all. And good night, all. I'm sure with Jeremy, I want to come down there next week to heck with this. And <laughs> to all the ships at sea, or whatever the saying was. Night, all. Good night. Good night, good night. Good night. <laughs> good night you all. Night, Take care. Guys. Stay safe. How big is my head up there on the screen? Oh, I got you inside now. <laughs> <laughs> For them in the council I'm just going to take the glass of red wine that I've got behind.